Well, good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. And have Easter to those watching on the live stream. Wherever you're watching from, welcome to you joining us and all those in our shared space down there in our uh, Foothill Student Ministry area. Thank you for being down there and uh, watching from there as well. So today, what I want to do is answer a question. Why we need Easter? Why do we need Easter anyway? I mean, literally almost two billion people are celebrating Easter today in some way, in some fashion. So what, why do we need it? So let's get the obvious on the table right at the beginning. It does generate a lot of money in our economy, right? I mean, come on. Let's just say it. It does. Candy manufacturers, they're counting on about $2.3 billion in candy sales. I know my wife contributed to that. We got grandkids coming over and they hit the mother load today, this afternoon. That's right. So we contributed to that. Uh, that um, Since we're speaking on candy here, um, 90 million chocolate Easter bunnies were produced for this day. If you're into that Easter bunny thing like that, like chocolate, you know there's an actual way you're supposed to eat them. Seriously, who makes rules about eating chocolate? I mean, come on. Anyway, so they say 89% of Americans believe you should eat the bunny from the ear first. Whatever. So 5%, 5% say go for the tail first. So, so you, all you nonconformists out there, you go. All right? I'm proud of you. Now, many of you, uh, if you don't know this, I had this thing against peeps. If you're a peep lover, hey, no judgment here. But those things, they're just nasty. I'm just telling you. <laughs> And people know that. And so in between the, ser before the first service, somebody showed up and gave this to me because they know peeps on a stick. Seriously. Lord help you. Okay. Anyway. So I do have some uh, peep data just because. It's just, it's random and weird. 700 million peeps for Easter. All right. So there, there's, somebody likes these things. All right. And if that's you, Lord bless you. Okay. But I thought this, I'm not making this next data point up, all right? I'm not making this up. I actually found this. Okay, so 700 million peeps they're going to make for Easter. But in 2020 and 2021, so this is during COVID. None of us want to remember that. But during COVID, a study says that peeps experienced a staggering 615% increase in demand. Okay, I have lots of questions, okay? What? What were people doing with all the peeps? Now, somebody's a math whiz out there, so you can go 700 million and then increase that by 650%, and somebody give me that, I didn't, I didn't crunch those numbers. What was going on? Okay, so, uh, just weird. Number one, Easter candy. What do you think that is? Number one, Easter candy, the most popular Easter candy. Jelly beans, jelly beans. Jelly beans. Uh, hate to break the news for you. That's number three. Number three. Number one, here you go, Reese's peanut butter eggs. Woo! Yeah. And some of you are like, no. Okay. Settle down. <laughs> Stay friends here. Okay. Let's move past candy. Oh, that's enough. Retailers need Easter because they're looking at uh, making $3.7 billion on, uh, you know, like Easter clothing and baskets and eggs and stuff. Uh, grocery stores, they need Easter because, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to make over $5.7 billion on what many of us do after this. You're going out to a restaurant, you're having family over. I know we're having family over. We have like 32 people total. And yeah, yeah, we, we, spent, we spent, I mean, good grief, just that one ham I think was 40-some bucks. Anyway, so moving on. Uh, well, okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's making lots of money in our economy. And let's also the Easter Bunny would be out of a job, I guess. So if you're doing the whole Easter Bunny thing. Why do we need Easter? Why does humanity need Easter? Now, again, sure it's a cash cow, generates lots of money. But for a Christian, for a believer, for a follower of Jesus, why would we think about something in the past? Why would we reflect on an event that took place 2,000 years ago? We're going to answer that question. Here it is. See, the past helps us remember. Easter reminds us of God's story about humanity. The events of 2,000 years ago, men and women, are connected to a greater cosmic story. See, today I want, I want to introduce you to maybe a God that you, 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 you don't fully know. Some of you do. But some of you have an idea about God that's simply not true. I'll get to that at the end. 
And I want to introduce you to a story that you may not have ever heard, or maybe you've never heard about it in its entirety, or maybe you've never heard about this thing. Yes, you heard about the resurrection. That's why we're here. But you've never heard it in the context of the story. Why is there a resurrection? Especially if you're new to this thing. You're, you're new to church. You, you, you came because somebody invited you. You didn't really want to be here. Thanks for doing the loving thing. You're here anyway. Good job. All right? But, but uh, if you don't understand, what's the big deal about this whole resurrection thing? Uh, you will leave today knowing why it's such a big deal. You will know. So Easter reminds us. There's four things I want to share with you this morning. And we're going to go through this pretty, pretty quick. First, Easter reminds us of the reason. There was a reason Jesus came. Humanity was in a hopeless situation. So the creator, since humanity couldn't fix the problem, the creator came after his creation. So where did the problem start? The Bible tells us the story, Romans 5, 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone because everyone sinned. The Bible tells us, a story of the very first people that God created. Yes, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden. Yes, the Bible says this was actually real. It actually happened. It actually existed. And God created a perfect environment. He created these perfect people to live in the manner that he created them to live. But he gave them a choice. God says, listen, you can live my way or you can do your own thing. And when you do your own thing, listen, here's this perfect garden. You have free reign. But there's one tree I don't want you to eat from. The knowledge of, the good, knowledge of good and evil. You stay away from that tree. They had a choice. And so what they did is they chose to do their own thing instead of God's thing. And then sin entered humanity from that point on. What's the big deal? They did their own thing. What's the big deal with this thing called sin? Sin is like a spiritual virus, folks. A spiritual disease that infects every person on the planet. There is no person that is immune from this disease of sin. Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. What does everyone mean? It means everyone. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Again, so what is sin? It is missing God's standard, his glorious standard. So just like Adam and Eve, we all willfully choose to disobey what God says is right. For them, it was eating from a tree God said not to. But for us... How many times have we all known what the right thing to do was? This is the right thing, and we willfully choose to do the opposite. That's sin. And we all have the same problem. Well, Pastor Dale, I'm a good person. I didn't say you weren't a good person. You just have the same virus everybody has called sin. All right, so what's the big deal? What are the consequences? Glad you asked. The virus of sin is terminal, it's that serious. It is terminal spiritually. It is terminal physically. Isaiah 59 2 says it is your sins that have cut you off from God. Sin creates a barrier between humanity and God. That's what it does. An impassable barrier. An impossible barrier. The relationship we were made for. And we were made for relationship with God. You go back to the beginning of the story. We were made for relationship with God. That whole relationship was destroyed. It was hindered because of sin. This actually creates what the Bible calls a spiritual death. In fact, this is how the Bible describes it. It says we were spiritually dead and cut off from God because of sin. Romans 6.23 says for the wages of sin is death. It just states it bluntly like that. The result of sin is a spiritual death. It is a separation from God in this life and for all eternity if it's not fixed. And it also will result in physical death. We were never created to experience death. But sin makes death inevitable. Now, the wages, the results, the consequences of sin is always death. The reason for our existence was altered because of sin. That's the story. That's how the Bible tells the story. Mankind has been making attempts to reconnect with God ever since. Folks, have you ever wondered why there's thousands of religions? Yeah, how come there's all kinds of religions? It's because God says in his word, I put eternity in the heart of humanity. We know there's more. We know there's an eternal. Uh, we, we know there's something beyond this life. And so mankind is constantly trying to do something to connect back to the eternal because it is hardwired into our very DNA to know there's something beyond this life. And so in mankind's attempts, they create religion. 
But religion is always a, a human attempt to fix yourself, to cure yourself, to try to cause yourself to reach heaven, reach paradise, become enlightened, uh, you know, experience nirvana, pick your poison, okay? But it's just an attempt and all it does is mask the problem. It never deals with the virus of sin. It never cures it. It simply treats the symptoms. It just, religion just treats the symptoms. It never cures the problem. So it reminds us of the reason. Jesus came because we were hopeless without him. So it reminds us of the ransom. You're thinking, ransom? It's the second thing. Mark 10, 45. This is Jesus. This is what he said about himself. Not my opinion. This is Jesus. He's talking about himself. For even the son of man, he calls himself the son of man, came not to be served, but to serve others and to, here it is, give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus never showed up to simply be a good teacher or create a new religion. You might believe that about Jesus. Listen, I'm really glad you're here and I respect your opinions, but that's a wrong opinion. Jesus never said that about himself. He did not come to start a new religion. He didn't come to just be a good teacher. He came to be a ransom. And that might be really new to you. A ransom. A ransom for sin had to be paid. God's justice had to be satisfied. He came to be the cure to the cosmic problem of sin that invaded humanity. And you're thinking, why would he do this? Why would he just wash his hands of us, all right? It's because he loves you. I know it says God loved the world. But today I want you to realize that he loves you. Look at the word of God, 1 John 4.10. This is real love. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. He loved you and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away, yes, our sin, your sin too. So God came after us. God loves you and his love compelled him to be the cure. He took away the penalty of our sin and what he did is he satisfied justice. And I want to explain that really briefly. You're going, what do you mean he satisfied justice? Justice, justice, true justice. And God is a just and holy God. Justice requires a punishment. Where there are no consequences for wrong behavior, there is no justice. We all know this inherently. This is why we get so upset when we watch the news. We see things happen that are wrong. They're just wrong. And, and, and there's no justice because there's no consequences. There's no punishment. We're not being mean. We have justice hardwired in us. There's justice when you break the law. You go out and drive 60 miles an hour on Main Street. Please don't, okay? But if you do, you're going to see those little red and blues behind you. And uh, Malala's finest will pull you over. I am guaranteeing you, you will get a ticket for doing that. Because justice requires it. Well, since the wages of sin is death... The consequences of sin is death. Jesus came to be the ransom, the payment to satisfy God's justice in our place. We were guilty. How did he accomplish this? Jesus' death on the cross was the ransom for our sin. And I love this passage in Colossians 2. It is one of the, the clearest explanations of what Jesus did on the cross. Look, for you. Colossians 2 says that you were dead because of your, your sins. So, so see, see how it's talking about the spiritual death. You, you were not alive in your relationship with God. You were spiritually dead because of your sin, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive. See, he, he created something new inside of you with Christ, for he forgave all your sin. How he do that? He canceled the record of the charges against you. You see how it's even in legal language? What do you mean charges against me? Everything you've done wrong, God already knows. He knew everything you would do wrong. He knew every willful choice you would make against him 2,000 years ago when he hung on the cross. Knew every wrong choice. Loved you anyway. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross, look what it says there, okay? He took those charges against us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. That's what was happening on the cross. It was not merely a Roman crucifixion. It was not merely an angry mob. It was not really bad luck. That's not what was taking place on the cross. It was the plan. 
God became man and he, he lived amongst us. Yes, he taught good things, but he, the plan was to go to the cross. And as Jesus hung on the cross, your sin, my sin, the sins of the world were being nailed to the cross with him. And he paid the price. And that's why when Jesus died, he says, it is finished. What's finished? Justice satisfied. Ransom paid. Sins forgiven. That's what that meant when he said it's finished. Yeah, amen. Now we're going to get to the resurrection. Oh yeah, the resurrection. That's the proof. That's the proof. The power of sin and death now was broken. But since the wages of sin was death, Jesus paying the price for sin had to result in resurrection. The death wage was paid and now death itself has lost its power. So the resurrection is essential. The sin virus is terminal. And the only way for there to be a cure to sin is by conquering death. So how do you prove you've conquered death? There's only one way to prove you've conquered death. Resurrection. And that's what Jesus did. Three days later, death and sin have lost their power. And Jesus, through this resurrection, became the cure, the antidote, and everything that humanity needs. Easter reminds us of the ransom, and that was Jesus. Now, Easter also reminds us because of that, there can be a restored relationship. Restored relationship. The relationship that was lost with Adam and Eve can now be restored. So look, we, you and I are invited into a relational experience. Look at these verses that, that are describing what we're invited into. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.9. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. He's not going to lie. He's forgiving us. And he's invited you into, check this out, partnership. Huh? Partnership. Partnership. With his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 5.10 says, For since our friendship with God. Isn't that an interesting word? Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. He came after us and restored the friendship. Jesus came to restore the relationship that was lost. He didn't come to create a religion, folks. I'm going to say it again. He came so that we could enjoy a present relationship with him. Jesus is alive and he's with us and we can experience him in this life. And so we are invited into religion. Religion is dead. So we're not invited to something that's dead. We're invited into a person who is alive. And that's why it's called a partnership. That's why it's called a friendship with Jesus. You can't have that in religion, but you can have that with someone who's alive. This doesn't sound, again, like a religion, does it? It sounds like something that is very real, very personal, very experiential, and it is highly experiential. So how can we experience this partnership, this friendship, this experience with God through Jesus? We're invited to accept Jesus and his ransom. It's very simple. John 1 says, that, but to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. See, there is that thing again. Something now is awakened. It's, it's created. It's something new. Spiritual life happens in me. Not with a physical birth. No, but a birth that comes from God. God does this. He forgives us and he gives us new life and puts it in us. What did we do? Nothing. See, it's so different than religion. Religion is telling, always telling you what you have to do to be good, to be saved, go to heaven. This it is nothing about that. It is all about Jesus and what he did for you. And we were invited to accept Jesus and his ransom. How do I do this? You just make a choice. It's an act of your will, folks. A relationship requires a choice from two people. If you ever wonder is if Jesus chose you, the answer is yes, because you look at the cross. And every time you look at the cross, that was Jesus' choice. He chose you. He loves you. He went to the cross for you. So what does Jesus think of you? He loves you today. He knows everything that you've done, and he loves you today. He went to the cross for you. Now he waits for you to make that choice. How do I make that choice? Really easy, okay? Lord, I choose you. You chose me. Now I have to choose you, all right? I choose to accept and receive. Don't believe just in the, in the historical Jesus. That's not enough. You, you have to receive what he offers. He's, he's asking you to receive his forgiveness. He's asking you to receive the, the, the cure for the disease of sin. And you have to recognize that need that you can't fix this thing. You can't be good enough to fix this thing. Only Jesus can be the cure. You have to be, believe and accept. 
But it's that simple. Lord, I do. I believe. I accept. I want a relationship with you. And in that moment, spiritual life happens inside of you. And then once that new life is, is now alive in you, we get to now walk in that relationship. And that's why we're invited to follow Jesus in this life. Not follow religion, but follow a person. And Jesus said this, John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and here's what they do. They follow me. See how experiential that is? Remember, again, it's not a religion. It is all about a relationship. It's all about a partnership. It's all about a friendship. It's all about experience. It's experiential. Jesus invites us to do life with him. Isn't that exciting? Jesus says, I want you to do, I want to do life with you. I want you to follow me through life. I want to lead you through life. I want to show you how to navigate life. Jesus said that I've come to give you life in its fullest measure. I want you to have a life in the fullest way that, that people can have life in this broken world. It's still marred by sin. It's still broken. But if you follow me, I'm going to help you navigate this life in a way that you cannot experience it trying to do it by yourself. So follow me. So it's not just having our sins cured and, and having an eternity assured. It, it is also learning how to follow him in his life because he wants to give you life. I know this wasn't great enough because it is pretty great. There's one last thing. Easter reminds us of a, of a future. We have a future residence. Since death no longer defines us and our relationship with God has been restored, we have an eternity to look forward to. We don't have to live life in this fear of death. Death for the follower of Jesus is a simply a transition into eternity. This is what Jesus said. He said, your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Who are you trusting in? I mean, who are you trusting in? He says, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If there was not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you that when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am. Jesus made it very clear that we have something to look forward to. In fact, we have two things. I'm gonna wrap up with these two simple things. Simple yet profound. We have an eternity to look forward to. And why does this matter? Folks, no matter how difficult this life becomes, there is something better waiting for us. Jesus said that heaven is real. Not some mythical place. Heaven is real. Jesus said so. It is a literal place we will experience when we physically die. For those who have a relationship with Jesus, this current life, folks, we have a radically different perspective for we, as we follow Jesus through this life. This is the land of the dying, not the land of the living. This is the land of the dying. Really? Well, yeah, because we're all going to die. This is the land of the dying. We're going to the land of the living. That's, that's the reality. That's where our true residence is. That's where our hope is. It's not in this broken place. And we follow Jesus through the brokenness. But he says, listen, I have created a place for you. You, you, you anticipate that. You expect that. Because you are going to be where I am. And when you take your last breath on this earth, you take your first breath in glory, in heaven. Count on it. Because that, Jesus said, is real. And not only that, since we're looking forward to eternity, let's look forward to one more thing. And those are relationships. We have relationships to look forward to because men and women, there's only two things that were intended to be eternal. Our relationship with God, we were created for that. And we were created for relationships with each other. The only things that were meant to be eternal, our relationship with God and the people that we love. I am looking forward to heaven for a lot of reasons, okay? Not only to be out of this broken world, but I'm looking forward to the relationships that are waiting for me there, relationships that will join me there because of our relationship with Jesus. Hope, eternity gives us so much hope. Easter reminds us of the future, that our hope is not in the brokenness of this world. Our hope is where we're going, where we truly belong. And where that longing for eternity is finally satisfied. So folks, why do we need Easter? Easter reminds us who God is. Easter reminds us of the story. Easter reminds us what God did so that we could have a relationship with him. It reminds us of the story of God's redemption. And that's really what the Bible is all about. How God draws people back to himself. This is who God is. This is what God does. See, as we finish... I've had so many conversations with people over the years who they have an idea about God. And maybe you have an idea about God here today too. And, 
And sometimes our, our idea about God or our belief about God just isn't accurate. And a lot of times people reject God or they reject Jesus because they have a made up version of who God is in their heads. Sometimes because of really uh, for painful experiences. Sometimes because they've had really bad experiences in church. Or they've had really bad experiences with church people. Well, let's just call it out. Sometimes that's reality. And people have said, well, if that's God, and if that's what he's about, then I want nothing to do with him. All right? And, and that might be some of you who are, who are sitting here. Listen, today, I, I, I want to graciously challenge what you believe about God. Because if that's what you believe about God, it's inaccurate. It's inaccurate. I just shared with you, this is who God is. This is, this is who he is. This is what he does. God loves you. He came to save you. I want to ask you to not reject a mythical version, your version, don't, don't, uh, of God. Because quite frankly, it, often when people explain to me what they really believe about, about God, I would reject that God too. But the God of the Bible, the, the God who came after you, the God who loves you, the God who saved you, the God who paid the price for your sin, the God who was resurrected, the God who wants relationship and friendship and partnership, that, that God, the God who will walk with you through life and show you how to do life and, and, and you can lead you through life, the God who will never abandon you, never fail you, that God, please don't reject that God because that's the real God. That's really who he is. This is really what he does. I asked the worship team just to play a, a song. They're going to sing a song. You're going to stay seated. Because I just want you to reflect on it. And some of you, maybe you've, you've heard a version of the gospel. We call it the gospel good news because it's really good news. Um, or a version of God that you've never heard before. And I want you just to just keep reflecting on that. And they're going to sing a song that just basically says, this is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. And today I just want to ask you, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Let God save you today. So you listen to this song, stay seated, keep reflecting. I don't know, come back up and we're going to pray when they're done. Yeah, that's who Jesus is, okay? Bore the cross, you know, crush the grave, beat the grave, and he came to save. So as I finish, I'm just going to say it again, please. Listen, if you're going to reject Jesus, you better reject the real Jesus. Not some Jesus you make up in your head. Because the Jesus of the Bible, he came to save. He came to save. So some of you, I know you've, you've never made any kind of a decision for Jesus. Maybe you just, you've just never understood it that, wow, I need to be saved. You do. Every one of us. We have the same problem. But we also have the same cure. It's Jesus. That's why Easter's such a big deal. That's why we get all excited about it. And sometimes, uh, weep over it. Because he saves us all. You too. So, let's pray. So just bow your heads. And if you've never invited Jesus to save you, it's really simple. You can just, in your heart, just go, Lord Jesus, save me. It is that simple. Lord Jesus, save me. Forgive me. I believe you. I receive you. And if you'll pray something that simple, spiritual life, connection with God begins right now. And now I invite you to follow him. Maybe some of you have been away from God for a very long time. Hey, guess what? He's still here for you. Maybe you invited the Lord into your life years ago. But you know what? He's still waiting for you to come back. He loves you just as much as he ever did. He never walked away from you, even though you walked away from him. And it is completely appropriate right now for you to say, Lord Jesus, would you save me too? Save me too. Bring me back to you. This is who God really is. 
Lord Jesus, Lord, how do we say thank you for saving us? The words don't seem to express the depth of our gratitude or the depth of our need. But we will, we'll say it again. Thank you. Would you draw people to yourself? Would you let the story continue because it's continuing? Would you breathe life into the people here in this room, those on the live stream, those, those down at FSM? Because, because Lord, we need you to keep saving us every day. You are a God who saves. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that you love us. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Happy Easter. <laughs>